Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're logged in from. Uh, nice to see you on this uh, holiday week. Um, today's, um, well, let's see, we need to advance the slides. There we go. Um, today's program is on the alternative payment models as presented in the MIPF macro final rule. Um, my intention today is, is first uh, some general comments uh, uh, and uh, what's, uh, what's a wild card administration that just voted into office uh, um, mean to the future of MACRA. Um, brief review of the, the, the basics of the program uh, as, as you've seen in past uh, uh, webinar series uh, and then we'll dig in deeply into the what Medicare is calling the first pathway of the quality payment program, alternative payment models, uh, op and then uh, review some opportunities, risks, and strategies for you, uh, uh, what you should be thinking about in terms of alternative payment uh, models. So first, uh, of course, MACRA was signed into law um, in uh, April of 2015, uh, and I, there's a lot of questions, a lot of misperceptions. Uh, one of the perceptions is that uh, w was when it was first signed into law that PQRS and meaningful use are over, uh, and of course that's wrong. Uh, the, these are just they're being reblended, remixed, renamed, rebranded. Um, and reintroduced uh, in a coordinated fashion as the quality payment program. Uh, although the, the old names are going away, much of the mechanisms, much of the uh, um, uh, projects and processes you went through remain. Um, also, uh, uh, when uh, Administrator Slavitt uh, announced uh, um, uh, pick your pace options, the there, there was a widespread rumor that MACRA was being delayed, and it's not. It really is is here. It's been amended for the first year uh, from its original form, but it is still here. And I think that first year, that 2017 performance year, is an extraordinarily important year for most of you, uh, for all of you, really, to get processes in place. Because once it hits, uh, uh, once some of the uh, concessions are taken out and some of the things that have been delayed get all, all put back in again in 2018 and 19. Um, those who are prepared for it will do much better than those who just wait till the last minute to, to do anything with it. Um, and finally, uh, certain, uh, certainly uh, a lot of question has come up with a new administration, whether MACRA is going to survive. And, and I'd like to point out uh, um, first, when, when MACRA was passed in April of uh, um, 2015, it passed without a whimper. Uh, it was really a bipartisan bill. Bill it had a 98 to two vote in the, in the Senate. Um, no, it's been on no one's platform during this uh, presidential race. Uh, no one's promised to to get rid of it, threatened to get rid of it, shown any uh, um, any distress about it whatsoever. Uh, and, and whereas it's true that the uh, the Affordable Care Act which is in the crosshairs uh, and uh, a priority for the first hundred days of this president's administration to, to repeal. Um, uh, and it did govern a lot of what we've done in PQRS, uh, value-based modifier, uh, quality tiering for the last couple of years. Um, MACRA has really taken over everything. So it, that's driving what we do for the, for the next five years uh, at least. Um, so uh, there, there really is, repealing ACA won't do anything uh, to, to the requirements under MACRA. Um, of course, uh, we don't know exactly what might come up, but because it, it's, it's been so popular, it's been a bipartisan bill, I really don't expect anything to happen with the MACRA program uh, in these coming couple of years. Um, so MACRA is here to stay. The old programs, uh, and don't forget that there's one more submission year in PQRS, 2016, one more year to uh, uh, lose money for, money for PQRS or value-based modifier to both either gain or lose under the quality tiering program. Uh, meaningful use or still a requirement. Uh, meaningful use is still in its, its old form for this coming year. And don't forget that Medicaid and hospital meaningful use really isn't changed at all by MACRA, so those, are, those continue in force. The only thing that changes is uh, I think uh, um, Medicare meaningful use was a, uh, uh, in many, many states, I think most or if not all states was um, satisfied, uh, some of the, the terms there cross-pollinated um, with Medicaid and hospital, and that no longer, since the, the 
Medicare meaningful use is gone um, and now rolled into advancing care information in the MIPS program. Um, that has changed in that fashion. So again, uh, this slide illustrates those old programs we've come to know and love as the physician quality reporting system, the value-based modifier system quality tiering, Medicare HR incentive programs. They aren't really gone. Names are changed to being rebranded, remixed. Uh, rules are different. It's now no longer so much pay for performance, uh, pay for reporting, as it is pay. For, it is now purely pay for performance, um, and it, uh, they've all been unified and coordinated under the Quality Payment Program (QPP). Uh, and I think it's important that Medicare is, uh, has determined these as first and second pathways. Uh, which gives uh, an interesting insight into their into their emphasis. And I think um, the surprise to me is this has progressed from legislation in 2015 to, to proposed rule in the, the spring of, of this year to the final rule that's out now as, as how that first pathway has really been brought to the forefront as uh, as a, a high a strong high priority of Medicare. So I think uh, an understanding of that is pivotal to your understanding of the whole program uh, and the purpose of today's discussion. Um, and of course, that second pathway then the merit-based incentive payment system, which is um, uh, built on the fee-for-service system, uh, uh, the the adjust, adjusted payments for for cost and quality. Uh, now. Medicare it does have a fairly nice, uh, um, readable, uh, attractive website to uh, uh, to get information about the quality payment program. It's here at uh, qpp.cms.gov. Um, it's not completely fleshed out yet, but the the, the information there is is remarkably readable uh, and accessible. So you you should get familiar with that site. Um, and uh, and I, I'd like to point out that the, one of the major changes, um, one of the things, reasons I like the MIPS macro program over the old programs is a change from this dynamic. This is quality tiering. This was the pay for performance overlay, or is, I should say is, because this is active for another year. Um, you're going to have, a, you're going to be playing in quality tiering, competing with each other uh, based on your 2016 submissions, and the adjustments queued by quality tiering are going to pay out in the 2018 payment year. Um, but the, the critical dynamic here um, is that this combination of programs in the past ha have been uh, uh, pay for, uh, have been uh, pass fail. So most of you are unfamiliar with quality tiering. When I'm speaking at, at, at uh, locations, I, I ask, who knows quality tiering? Who knows what it's all about? And almost no hands go up. This has been a stealth program of Medicare's. And the, the reason is because eighty, even if you're susceptible to it, 80% uh, of your uh, um, of practices that's, that's in this, this range here, 80% never suffer from it. They stay in the, there's no change to their payments whatsoever. Until you hit this small move, this small uh, differential, a little bit worse performance right here at the 10th percentile, and suddenly you fall down the uh, uh, this cliff to lose 2%. Uh, and then a little further down, you fall down another cliff to take it to 4%. Um, and uh, again, on the other end, you, you go up suddenly to, to uh, 8% and, and as high as 16% in this most recent payment year. Um, so that, that pass-fail dynamic is extremely awkward, and you even overlay meaningful use on that as another pass-fail dynamic. And Medicare is moving in this whole set of programs to, to more of a continuous variable. So you will see the, the results of your efforts uh, on, uh, at, at the small increments of change. So they're combining all those programs instead of separate pass-fail functions, all those programs into composite performance score. And using that composite performance score uh, to calculate an adjustment factor. Uh, now that that performance score uh, varies year by year in how it's calculated. And in this first year, the quality co contributes 60% of the points, cost zero, uh, uh, advancing care information, which is the um, um, uh, which is the new meaningful use. Uh, contributes 25 and uh, clinical practice improvement activities uh, 
contributes 15. And that's scheduled year by year to change until it reaches a mature level of 30, 30, 25, and 15. Uh, and, and varies actually year by year by uh, whether you're MIPS or, an, or one of each APM almost has its own uh, component. Now the the adjustment factors are scheduled to change in this factor this faction. Uh, look, the payment year, the performance for this payment year is always two years earlier. So this year we're facing 2017 is the performance year for the 2019 payment year, and plus or minus four percent is hanging in the balance, and that progresses to its final year plus or minus nine. Um, and for the first five years, Medicare is throwing in this $500 million exceptional performance bonus, which clicks in here at a 70th percentile. So when you reach your combined, your combined final score of 70, you dip into that extra $500 million. So it, it raises this first amount, uh, everything below the zero line, uh, that, that has a revenue neutrality requirement by legislation. So everything collected below the line has to be delivered above the line. So 60% 60 60 of providers who are below the 60th percentile, of course, uh, contribute to the pot, and it's divided between the 40% of providers that are above that line, and plus then the, the, uh, um, the exceptional bonus clicks in. And of course, this is the modified graph for 2017, which indicates a couple of interesting uh, components. First, if you if you do nothing, then you fall into this this range here. Um, you lose four percent if you if you do absolutely nothing. But there really should be no excuse for anyone not to be able to collect something. Is everything a, be, Everything beyond nothing, it gets you into the incentive range. Of course, the total potential incentive is a lot lower than it would have been. Uh, Medicare is predicting it's going to be a little less than 1%, uh, although their, their exceptional performance bonus at 500 million will click in and possibly bring you up close to 2.5% at the t maximum potential incentive. But it, it really means that anything beyond the, the doing anything will avoid uh, the uh, the 4% penalty, and that includes submitting one measure on one patient. Uh, it, it looks like it's enough to get you uh, uh, a minimum of three points for every measure that you submit like that. Um, you can submit up to six measures uh, for scoring, uh, and six measures should give you an 18, which is about here. And if you can perform perfectly in uh, um, in care information and, and practice improvement, that's 15 and 25, 40 points, brings you up to 48, which is somewhere close to a half a percentage uh, incentive. So there's the do, do nothing, that's 4% loss right off the bat. One measure, um, no, you hit a, hit a score of three and you don't make or lose anything. Um, and that's one measure in ACI uh, after the base score. You have to have your, your four, base, uh, four or five uh, base score component uh, or one practice improvement activity. Any one thing um, gets, you that, uh, gets you out of the, the, the penalty range. Some data, that is if you go beyond, that's two measures or, uh, or a measure and, uh, uh, and ACI or a, a measure in CPIA. Uh, but anything beyond that one one activity moves you up the incentive scale, um, and then all in all in is 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 90 days of data in any of the uh, activities, um, and that's uh, so a full submission can you move move you further up into the incentive range. Um, now I think keep this in mind. If you choose this as, as an excuse to only submit the, min the minimum and do nothing else, it'll put you at a competitive disadvantage in 2018. I think what it's given us is an extra year to get prepared, uh, to make sure systems are in place, that you're tracking measures, you're prepared to get your full points in uh, ACI, all of your points in CPIA, and maximize your score. Because I think it is possible for everybody to uh, who puts effort into it. Um, to do well uh, in this system and be in the incentive range. The eligible clinicians in the first two years, it's that group on the left, they're dropping everyone on the right. Um, I'll be very surprised if the Secretary of Health and Human Services doesn't bring everybody back in. Um, probably not. They, he, by law, 
uh, they can be brought in in the third year. Uh, I would expect it's probably going to be the, the fourth year that they come back in, but one of those two I'd be uh, uh, is almost certain that everyone will join us. So with that in mind, that was a quick review of MIPS. Let's go into alternative payment models. Um, interesting, you remember that, that uh, just two slides ago now, I showed you the, qual the uh, eligible participants in, in MIPS. Um, this is the eligible participants in alternative payment, alternative payment models, which is everybody who is eligible for PQRS today. So everyone who's taken off the list for MIPS is put back into the list right away for APMs. So they're all eligible to earn that 5% incentive for being in an advanced APM. There's also critical access hospitals susceptible, uh, uh, veteran qualified health centers and rural health centers to the extent that they have Medicare Part B billings uh, can, can also benefit from this program. And behind everything, again, this is Medicare's movement from fee for service to push us all to the value-based purchasing uh, arena. Uh, and they hope to entice 50% of you to participate in an alternative payment model by 2018. That's just one short year away. Um, and they've built in enough confusing and conflicting uh, incentives that it could just happen. Um, now, you, to understand alternative payment models, there's some terms to, to come to an understanding. Uh, first, there's the garden variety alternative payment model. Uh, in which there's some upside gain. And, and that's really the only thing. Uh, well, they're trying to push savings by providing reward for making those savings. And the classic example is the shared savings model. And the ACO is uh, currently uh, uh, in place. As we move to advanced alternative payment models, it requires a couple of other things. The big thing is it requires downside risk and what Medicare calls more than nominal downside risk, which means if you spend more than you expect to on your patient population, that you lose money. And also, there's a minimum requirement for use of CEHRT, that is uh, um, Certified Electronic Health Record Technology. Um, there is a requirement that there be some kind of quality measurement, although the measurement is not typically used to score the organization, it's, but it's expected to be used by the organization to differentially pay providers who are doing a better job in quality and in cost. Um, and there's a couple of interesting models out there, medical home model and Medicaid medical home model that, uh, uh, that qualify as advanced or should. There's nothing on the ground yet, but it's, it's targeted to, to be introduced that will uh, be advanced alternative payment models. Uh, and then the entity is the group, it's the practice, it's the tax ID number, it's the parent organization, or it's the syndicate or consortium that is uh, participating in an advanced uh, alternative payment model. Uh, and the, the, the terms to remember there are qualified participants and partially qualified participants, which means you have to have a certain volume of patients coming through that payment model before you take advantage of the, uh, um, of the incentives um, and, and the freedom from MIPS reporting um, to, to be there. And I'll get, get into some of the details in, in other slides. Now, these are the only advanced alternative payment models that are on the ground as of the writing of the final rule or the, the uh, publication of the final rule on November 4th. Um, so if you're in one of these, you are on an advanced payment model, everything else, if, it's, if it is an APM, it's not an advanced APM. Now, Medicare has a sprint on. They, they expect to publish several more um, uh, APM, advanced APMs by January 1st and actually give you an opportunity to participate in those and these to open up those uh, um, peer, uh, those enrollment periods perhaps uh, um, into January. So look for opportunities to get involved in those and other models, although you've got a fairly short amount of time to analyze them and understand them and decide whether they're, they're worth it. Um, now, the medical home model coming. I think the one thing to remember about medical home, there are a set of requirements to, to make them a medical home model, uh, to, to make them advanced payment models. Um, but I, I think the big thing to remember about this, it's easy to get them confused with patient-centered medical home. Uh, patient center medical home um, is a certification process that you, that 
you, you put in a certain set of, uh, um, of capabilities, you get certified by somebody as a patient-centered medical home, uh, and uh, that in some, some places uh, uh, confers some kind of a status on you, perhaps a preferred payment status. But the medical home model is really a, a payment mechanism with a certain shape to it. Now, some, some of these models may require you to be certified as a patient-centered medical home, but they don't necessarily go together. So being certified as a patient-centered medical home does not make you an advanced practice model, advanced APM, and being in the advanced uh, medical home model uh, APM does not necessarily require um, or conf and certainly does not confer um, certification status as a patient-centered medical home. Um, before I move on, oh, and one more thing on the on the medical home model. Um, after the first year, Medicare expects to limit it uh, because it, there's some advantages. That there's not as much discipline in some of the uh, uh, requirements to be a, a medical home. Uh, they're reserving it for smaller practices where the parent organization has 50 or less clinicians and saying that, yes, it's still, there's still value to the medical home model in larger groups, but they ought to rise to the requirements that are built into the advanced APM uh, um, subset of requirements. Um, and before I move off of just a general review of uh, alternative payment models, I, I think it takes a, a, a completely different shape than, than, the, than the ACO type of construct that we're seeing before MACRA. Uh, and that is to say APMs look more like insurance contracts. That year by year, Medicare or, uh, or commercial insurance will be offering uh, groups of physicians uh, a new contract. They say, isn't this a great way to, uh, isn't this a great new feature to offer our beneficiaries and wouldn't you love to uh, to be paid in this fashion they're going to offer you these contracts and, and you will accept or reject those contracts just like you do today uh, the, the garden variety uh, uh, insurance contracts uh, I think it sets you up to perhaps be in an alternative advance or an advanced alternative payment model without really knowing you're there um, uh, and and it also means you, you there may be multiple of these out there, and you'll see that in the scoring system that you'll see in a future slide. Um, now, to be eligible, for, there is an incentive involved with the advanced model, and to be eligible for incentive, you have to be at financial risk for losses. You have to be measured on quality by some means. It doesn't have to be MIPS, the, the MIPS model. It doesn't have to be, now all ACOs are using the uh, web interface for reporting today, and I'm making the assumption that that's the most likely mechanism going to be used as we go forward, but it's not required. Every alternative payment model that is proposed and is brought to life will define its own set of rules, including its own quality reporting requirements. It just has to be similar to uh, Medicare requires it to be similar to MIPS. And of course, there is a requirement that at least 50% of participants, so it's a relatively low bar, are using certified EHR technology. Um, and there was a proposal to rapidly increase that to 75, but that's been postponed. I don't know when. It could be increased to 75 as early as 2018, but it's not in the schedule yet to be increased. So the, the early timeline, by January, expect to see a lot more APMs and advanced APMs published and available for participation. Um, it's in 2017 is your first APM performance period. There are going to be three times that Medicare does what they call a snapshot to determine, a, determine participation. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and then, of course, MIPS and APM will have their reporting window to get quality uh, uh, CPIA and ACI data uh, to Medicare in the first quarter of 2018. Uh, they will run their algorithms on that and determine uh, who's been naughty and who's been nice uh, by the third quarter of 2018. Uh, and, of course, 2019 is when they expect to pay the lump sum uh, for 5% uh, on the uh, for the qualified uh, participants in advanced APMs and also MIPS adjustments will apply in that 2019, the first payment year. 
So it's just a, a moment to, uh, to contrast the advanced alternative payment model to the garden variety alternative payment model. So you only earn the 5% incentive in an advanced APM um, where there's downside risk. If you, if you spend more money than you expect, you'll lose money. Um, there's a favor, once the, now the, that 5% goes away after five, five years of the program, uh, and it's replaced by a favorable fee schedule conversion factor. So uh, for those QPs, qualified participants in an alternative APM, they will continue to have a financial advantage through that conversion factor in years to come. Um, the advanced APM is not susceptible to MIPS. Um, APM is. Uh, both share upside gains. So if you save money, uh, you should make more money. Uh, there could be a little bit of loss on the downside in a garden variety APM, but there has to be more than, more than nominal risk is what Medicare calls it. Uh, in the advanced APM, uh, there is a, a, a firm 50% requirement uh, for CEHRT uh, in the advanced side, varies by model in the, uh, in the garden variety side. Quality reporting is required in both, uh, but and is model specific. Um, both count for 50% of the practice improvement activity score, um, and there's and both have model specific scoring standards as it interacts with MIPS and and, and other scoring. Um, 2017 is your first performance period for an AP, advanced APM, um, and is the first determination period for being a qualified. Uh, uh, participant, and, and then of course 2019, as I said, was the lump sum distribution. Um, now, they've integrated, even though it's not used in the same way, there's still a similar scoring standard between um, APMs and, and MIPS, and there's also some interaction because you can't know until you've run the program for a year whether you're a qualifying provider or not. And it's specific to the year, just what percentage of your business flows through the advanced APM. So there, there's going to be some chaos here related to whether or not you are a qualified provider. And if you're not a if you are a qualified provider, you're immune from MIPS, and you earn the five percent uh, incentive. If you're not a qualified provider, you're subject to MIPS. You have to do a MIPS submission, uh, and and you don't make the five percent incentive, but you can earn the, the MIPS incentives. Um, so quality, uh, so there are some interesting interactions between the reporting and some protections that weren't available in the old system. In the old system, if the ACO failed to report, report for you, you were out of luck. Um, but in the new system, if the APM, if, if the entity, if the APM entity reports for you, those, those metrics flow down and are attributed to you whether you end up being a QP or not. Uh, and you can use those numbers generated by the entity to meet your MIPS requirements. Uh, and if the, if the entity fails to report, you can report as individuals and as groups, as tax ID numbers, and that data flows up and is aggregated at the entity level if you happen to be, um, uh, happen to be uh, QPs. So, uh, so quality, generally we're expecting the entity group to submit your quality data. Cost, of course, is always calculated, calculated by Medicare, so no one ever makes any submission for that. Improvement activities, every APM comes with an expected set of improvement activities. That by being an APM, you get 50% of your improvement activity points. If they require patient-centered medical home status, that gives you all your points. Uh, if they require, you know, that, that kind of thing. So when Medicare approves a program, they're going to be assigning a, a set of improvement activity of points to that, and you're automatically going to get those points by being involved in the in the entity. It, yes, with with the uh, with a model. Uh, if it doesn't give you 100% of your improvement activity points, you can make additional submission as an individual or as a group to get all of your points. They're also going to be looking for individuals or tax ID numbers to to report on advancing care information, the new meaningful use. Um, and it's interesting. There are some conflicting data in the in the in the final rule. 
in one sense they say they're not going to look at the individuals to see if they're if they're in meaningful use they're counting on the APMs to police their own ranks but then again they're requiring they are, they are putting this infrastructure in place to collect meaningful use data the ACI data from from participants so I'm not sure what the truth is here but they are saying that you need to uh, submit uh, you have the opportunity to submit uh, CIA uh, CPIA and the ACI that is improvement activities and uh, meaningful use data um, whether you're APM or MIPS. Uh, and again, eliminated that, that rise to seven, that automatic rise to 75% of EPs have CEHRT. But what you do need to know is um, you can be on 2014 or 2015 edition CEHRT for 2017, but you have to be on 2015 edition in the 2018 year. Every hospital entity in an APM has to be using CEHRT. There's no 50% rule there. Um, and again, this is where they, they, they said, I, I copied while I was reading that part of the rule, that they will assess, they're going to judge the APMs on their requirement to have a certain amount of CEHRT, but it does look like they'll look beyond that as well at the, at the participants. Uh, and you know, th there's some, some confusion here. I, 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 I'm not going to put any uh, hard and fast rules in place for how you're going to be judged, uh, how the this, this scoring is going to happen. As, uh, as you see this, each model is a little bit different. So if, as whatever model of APM, we'll have to look a little bit more deeper, uh, a little more deeply uh, into that. Um, and we talked about that flow up and that flow down from the, from the reporting that is possible in the uh, MIPS program and wasn't uh, as easy in the, in the old programs. The final financial risk, let's talk about that non-nominal risk level. Um, so if your ex actual expenditures exceed predicted, something has to, something adverse needs to be able to happen. Either you get, payments are withheld from the entity, uh, payment rates are reduced subsequently, repayment is required uh, or for the medical home model that's getting some extra money for being in that model those that extra monies can be forfeit uh, and any of those models work for uh, for some kind of a loss standard uh, and, and this illustrates how um, most uh, risk models are or many risk models are created um, and start where's my oh, there's my pointer so uh, the, the couple of techniques that are typically used, one is a minimal loss rate. So down here, that means you're not going to suffer any losses until you reach middle, a minimum. It says, don't bother me with a small amount. The insurance company, uh, whether it's Medicare or commercial insurance, absorbs that amount that's in the minimal loss rate. And then the next is the marginal risk. As you start losing money, uh, uh, there's a sharing that the, the entity loses some and the insurance company loses some. Um, and there... Uh, there, there had been an initial proposal that that had a minimum amount of, of sharing, and that's this slope here as it rises. And then there's a cap that, that, you're, that you're susceptible to loss up to a certain level, uh, and then, it, it, then that's, it's, your loss is capped there. <coughs> now, to implement the program, Medicare has actually uh, abandoned the minimal loss rate and marginal risk rate as requirements. That doesn't mean that your contract won't include those, but they're not required uh, and there's no standards put on them uh, uh, as a uh, um, to uh, uh, as a requirement. Um, the um, They're maintaining two and their total potential risk options. Uh, one is based on entity revenue. So what is the total revenue of the of, of your entity if you're if you're um, participating as a tax ID member, what's your total revenue? Uh, or what's the, uh, or the second is benchmark based standard, which is total cost for all attributed beneficiaries. Um, so, and that of course, the number goes outside of your organization. Um, so the, the number here is smaller, you can be at, at the 3%, if you're at risk for 3% of your uh, expected expenditures of, of the uh, uh, of your beneficiaries, that meets the standards under the benchmark. Uh, this could be more or less money, depending on the nature of your organization. You have to be at risk for 8% of your own revenue, um, either or, not both. Um, and again, this number, although 
bigger in percentage could be a smaller number than uh, than a small cut of the, of the whole pie. So, and then the different standards for the medical home model, and we won't go into that since uh, um, none of those are on the ground yet. Um, full capitation risk arrangements uh, would be acceptable, uh, but Medicare Advantage does not will not be an advanced APM. Those are those are by legislation just not considered. Pro probably an oversight might be maybe Medicare Advantage would be pulled back into this program over the next several years. Uh, who knows? Um, and then, so the next process is once you've got your your, your uh, entity on the ground, you've got a few contracts that that play as as advanced alternative payment models. It has to be determined whether or not you are a qualified participant and qualified for that incentive. Um, and Medicare intends to do it in this way. Uh, each entity is going to publish a participation list, which is the providers who are part of the program. Uh, and also an affiliated pr practitioner list, which may be providers outside of the organization who are also participating. And, and that's different because they don't have as much skin in the game, uh, and Medicare plans to always have, analyze them individually, whereas those who are part of the entity, they plan to always at least start with a group analysis, and, this, and the whole group will qualify or disqualify together. Um, and then if they don't qualify together, They'll look at them individually. Every individual will be looked at for all of the programs and all the practices in which they work. It'll pierce that tax ID number limitation, go outside, and you can end up being a qualified practitioner, for a participant, a QP, based on multiple programs, multiple practices, uh, and aggregate that all together to meet the, be the benchmarks for, qual for um, qualification. They plan to take three snapshots through the year. Uh, so in this coming year, 2017 is your first QP performance year, and it's also going to have three snapshot periods to determine whether or not you're a participant. At each time, they'll look at those lists to see if you're on the list, and they'll also look at volume to see if you've got the required volume by allowable charge or the, or the required volume by percentage of patients that make you qualified. And if you're ever on the list or if you're ever qualified in any of those three snapshots, you are on the list and qualified. Um, so it just it accumulates through the year and they plan to have the August 31st data available by the last day of the year so you can so you know whether you're on the hook for a MIPS submission and whether or not you can expect to get the 5% incentive. And then you have to make a, a, a sudden decision of whether you're going to be Going to, if you're a partial QP, you have the choice. As a QP, as a qualified provider with a higher level of charges or patients flowing through your alternative payment model, as a qualified um, participant, you get the incentive and you don't participate in MIPS. As a, a unqualified, below all the benchmarks, you don't get the incentive and you have to participate in MIPS. And if you're in the middle, partially qualified, you choose. And actually, you don't choose, your entity chooses. Now, what happens if you get it? I suspect you have an individual choice. If you get it on an individual level, uh, they didn't specify that in the final rule, but I, that's the only way that can work. And here are the, here are the thresholds um, to be a qualified participant. And a different threshold for each year, uh, 2019 and 2020, there's only a Medicare model of advanced APM. They'll in, in, they plan to introduce all payer combinations if they have commercial insurers who are, who are planning to play along. Um, those will appear in the years 2021 and beyond. Um, and there's one threshold for uh, the, um, the proportion of your payments, and where, there's my pointer, uh, for proportion of payments that uh, qualify you both to be a qualified provider, um, participant or a partially qualified participant, um, and and then a different uh, threshold for patient count, and that carries through all of these. Then when we move into the all payer uh, combos, there is a there is a requirement for a certain amount of Medicare um, patients that have to be or or volume that has to be there, and then there's a requirement for total. 
So you have to hit both of these uh, to be partial or, or, uh, or, or fully qualified. Uh, and this Medicare number is lower than the corresponding Medicare number above, although this number for if you're purely Medicare is the same number for your total in the combo uh, area. Uh, and, and again, um, um, you have both the payment amount and the patient count thresholds. So you can qualify by either of those thresholds. And Medicare plans to go through this sequentially, each of those um, snapshot dates. They'll look at, first they'll look at every APM entity, advanced APM entity as a group, and determine whether the group has the necessary volume requirements to qualify. And if they qualify, they qualify as a group, they don't go any further. Uh, and they look at Medicare first and in subsequent years, all payer model second. Um, if, you, if no one becomes a QP uh, on the group level, then they look individually, pulling all of your practices, uh, all your tax ID numbers, all your participation together, and you might qualify by either the, 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 the volume of charges or the uh, uh, volume of patients, you might qualify as a QP. Uh, if you don't make QP, then they look at, P, uh, at partial status, uh, first at the group level and at the individual level. So uh, again, a multi-step process that's happening multiple times in the year, giving you the, uh, the most favorable status by the end of the year. Uh, and then the advanced APM entity chooses for the group that's, n that's in the partial status the advanced APM entity chooses whether the group is participating in MIPS or not. And I suspect if you qualified as an individual, the group did not, that you will make that, discuss, that, that, that determination in the, as an individual. But I can't be entirely certain of that because that wasn't explicit in the rule. I guess I can imagine that the entity might, how would they choose for you since it would be multiple? It, you, you would have qualified by virtue of multiple entities that you're involved in. So I don't know. So path, let's start final in the, oh, we're, we're getting down quite quite nicely. There um, should be time for questions at the end. Is there a pathway to success? Yeah, I, I think so, but I think that the big thing to remember in the quality, quality payment program, I'm calling it CCC, Confusion, Chaos, and Churn. Uh, I think this is, although there are a lot of reasons why I prefer the MIPS environment to the PQRS and quality uh, tiering environments, I think they've done a good job of moving to a better model. Still, there's, it's very confusing and the interactions of these programs, particularly the interaction between the alternative payment model and MIPS, that's particularly confusing. Um, and I, I think what it, it's going to be an environment where you're not sure whether you're in an advanced payment model or an alternative advanced payment model. It may not be explicit in the contracts uh, that you're reviewing and accepting. Uh, and even if you do know, uh, it, it not, it's not going to be clear to you whether you hit those volume standards. And Medicare is doing those calculations, although we can help you in the background by doing some, some modeling and some predicting. Uh, but every data set is a little bit different, so even if your data set shows you to be fairly securely in the AAPM world, Medicare's data may disagree. And of course, the, clo uh, uh, the further, the deeper into the, uh, over the threshold you are, uh, the more likely you are to be, to be in agreement with, with Medicare. Um, but I, I think it's, it is the case where you might not be able to predict far in advance whether you're at MIPS or, or APM, whether you're advanced APM, um, where the incentive's coming from, whether you have to make a submission here or there. So being prepared to be flexible is, is key to your success. Then also, just because they're offering these advanced APM models doesn't mean they're good. That 5% of incentive looks good, uh, looks like it might be easy to achieve, but at a significant price. Uh, there's a substantial downside risk, and that 18 to 15 percent um, risk to your Part A and Part B revenue could easily outstrip anything you might make on the incentive side. So the, being ready for risk is going to be a big part of that APM decision. 
So the key success factors, I think you should be looking at a, at, at a vendor such as us for, uh, um, uh, to help you with the quality reporting, mostly because, and with an eye toward change, that this year you might need to be putting out a qualified registry submission to, 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 do, to do MIPS. Next year you might decide it, it needs to be a QCDR to get into some special measures where you can perform better. Next, the year after that you might need to do a web interface a submission to, to meet the advanced APM entity requirements and you don't want to be looking for a new vendor and changing that every uh, every time that uh, MIPS, uh, the, the quality payment program uh, suggests a change. So you want, need to be able to play in all those areas e equally well in any particular year. Um, under PQRS, our goal with you was to make a qualifying submission so any measure you could submit was uh, was on the, was was potential. I think as we move forward and we're purely pay for performance, you really need to choose measures that matter and invest your time and energy into matter, measures that mean something to you and mean something to your patients. If you work on measures that aren't within your scope of practice, if you're submitting measures that you don't care about, you're not going to be performing well in them. And if you don't perform well in them, you're going to fall down the adjustment scale to get a lower adjustment level or even be in the, in the penalty range. You also need to keep extra measures in the hopper. If Medicare requires a six measure set to be a successful set, you should be working on at least nine overall, if not 12 or 18. So when it comes time to choose your measures, you can choose the best six. Medicare is only going to, to score you on the best six, at least in, in the MIPS world, it changes a little bit in the uh, APM world. They're going to score you on the best six, but there's going to be a strategy to submit some measures you're not doing so well in. To uh, You won't be scored on them, but it will set you up for an improvement bonus. When you improve your performance on those over the next couple of years, you can get extra points for those that improvement. Uh, and also, you're going to need predictive analytics. Medicare believes you're going to be blind uh, in December when you choose whether your partially qualified uh, participant uh, is um, is going to do MIPS or not. But with, if, if we apply the right analytics to your data, we should have a good advanced warning of what your, uh, uh, what your final score or your composite performance score is going to be. We're, we should have a good idea how that will translate to, a, uh, uh, to an adjustment rate. Uh, and although we won't know precisely, we can, we can tell you that within some confidence limits. Uh, and because it doesn't have that big pass-fail component that quality tiering does, it should be reasonably accurate to at least get you in, in the ballpark and give you some data with which to make that, that quick decision whether you're MIPS or not. Uh, we should bring trending, um, we should be predicting the adjustments, we should be predicting your scores, give you confidence levels over that with, with a robust set of predictive analytics that help guide your choices. And with our Muse Collaborative uh, and, and other opportunities nationwide you have to learn, um, we, you can learn from your data and from your peers to, to find out where your deficiencies are, what measures are, you're not performing well in, and learn from people who are doing them well, what techniques can quickly bring you up to a higher level. So I think that's, those are some of the keys to, uh, to success under that quality payment program, particularly the flexibility, knowing that the, the, the the, the uh, ground is shifting under you every year, uh, but what's going to be consistent is the requirement to use certified electronic health technology to prove it, prove it with your ACI reporting, uh, to you to do do things in your practice to improve and to report those as clinical practice improvement activities, to constantly to to, to provide data that supports uh, your assertion that you're a high quality practice and to support that. Um, uh, to be able to put it out in different mechanisms, uh, you can see the mechanisms up here. Uh, qualified registry is still one of, the, in my opinion, the most cost-effective, most reliable method of reporting. But it's not. But other requirements and other opportunities will come to the fray. So we do have a qualified clinical data registry. You'll be able to report through, particularly to access uh, special measures uh, that Medicare hasn't uh, adopted into the. Uh, into the MIPS menu of measures yet, but might be much better for your specialty. Uh, EHR-based reporting, I think uh, uh, a, a lot uh, less emphasis on that 
in, in, in this coming rule. Uh, you've you may have heard of the electronic uh, reporting bonus, but that you no longer have to do an HR uh, submission to get that electronic bonus. Uh, you get that uh, from any of the techniques that have an all, all electronic data flow. Um, and web interface has an electronic submission uh, uh, component, uh, and a lot of a lot of uh, ACOs are doing that manually. Uh, the, the manual uh, limitation is that you can't uh, repeat it, uh, you can't see those uh, measures changing uh, over the year, so you really ought to move those into an automated uh, methodology uh, so you get early warning and again can put it out. Get the data in whatever way you can at the most uh, efficient for you. Um, work it through our, through our centralized algorithms uh, to get accurate uh, reports and numbers. See in your organization where you need work to improve those numbers and work on that steadily, particularly with help from your peers who uh, are doing better in those particular areas. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's where we're going. Um, so I'll give a, well, it's an unusual uh, webinar that no one has had uh, questions in the midst. But uh, we're here. Oh, no one that, uh, none that have been thrown to me anyway. Uh, my, my staff protects me from some, some of these measures um, or some of these questions. So here, Renee asks, will there be six measures specific to ED providers? Currently, there are only two measures that are ED applicable. How does an ED provider choose six measures or if there are not six applicable? All right, so this clearly goes beyond the APM uh, and kind of back in, into the MIPS world, but I, I crossed, so that's, that's certainly fair enough. Um, the new measures are out as of a few days ago, so I can't tell you uh, uh, off the top of my head what's there for ED providers. Um, there are more than two that are that are applicable, though they may not be easy for you to do. Um, there's two places to look for those. First, Medicare is publishing specialty-specific measure sets, so they're telling you what they think your specialty should be able to submit, and they're giving you additional protections by saying that you don't have to go beyond that measure set. Um, uh, now, they are saying you need six measures, and if that set has seven, they're saying there's no excuse that you can't submit six, even though several of them might be almost impossible to, to submit from an electronic data set. Uh, you may not be able to extract the data. Uh, they don't care so much about that, but, but you don't have to go beyond. If, if, the measure, if, the special, if the specialty measure set that Medicare publishes has only four measures, you get full credit for submitting only those four measures. Now the other place to look is we keep track year by year of how our clients are doing and we look to see uh, um, who has submitted certain things by specialty, how well they're doing on those, uh, how easy they are to extract um, uh, and we, we have published for years our own specialty recommendations based on our experience and the experience of our users. So um, that, is behind, that is in our, um, or behind our user interface. So if, if you're a client, you get, get to access that. I don't think we have that offered uh, to the outside world at this point. Um, but there's a lot of guidance there for what works, and we'll be enhancing that guidance as we get into MIPS. I think particularly bringing those benchmark numbers, how well are ED providers doing on these measures, so you can get some guidance how you might be able to do on that. Now I hear from Renante, uh, just to verify, if you're NCQA certified for PCMH, are you an APM or an advanced APM? You're neither. Because NCQA certification for patient-centered medical home is just certification for patient-centered medical home. It does give you 100% of your clinical practice improvement activity points. And unlike other, uh, other practice improvement activities, which Medicare expects to limit the number of years you can use any one of those for your act improvement activity points, they, they say, yeah, there's only so many years you should do this, then you should move on to something else. Patient-centered medical home is the final, is the goal. 
So if you achieve patient-centered medical home, it appears that you'll be able to use that for CPI activities as long as you remain uh, certified. But it is not an advanced payment mechanism um, or, or model. Uh, only if you sign a contract with an insurance company that um, looks like a, a medical home model are you an APM or an advanced APM. Um, it might require NCQA or other kinds of PCMH certification, but it is not an APM without that insurance contract. Come on, guys, it's time to chump the stump. Oh, stump, stump the chump, stump the chump. Yeah, there we go. Oh, one more coming, one more coming. I live for questions, so think them up, send them in. We have, Teresa says, or asks, we have four general surgeons. We, we reported to PQRS under the general surgery measure. Is there a general surgery measure under APM at this time, or would, uh, would reports under the MIPS program? Um, well, again, every APM is different, um, so they're all each going to have their own reporting rules. Uh, there isn't a general surgery APM in existence at this moment, although bundled payments are probably the, one of the closest um, you have to, to getting there, and there should be something under bundled payments. Maybe not for general surgeons, I think, uh, uh, orthopods are more likely to be affected first from what I'm seeing in the development path. Um, but anyway, I wouldn't expect anything in the APM environment uh, for 2017. Uh, and under MIPS, measure groups, measures groups for 2017 have been discontinued. I think that's a grave mistake. Um, well, for 2017, we can live with it because there's uh, uh, they've softened everything, and it should be easy for everyone to avoid the, the penalties, uh, the, the negative adjustment. But as we move into 2018, um, the lack of measures groups is going to be uh, uh, going to cripple a lot of small practices. Virtually anyone who doesn't have access to their electronic medical re record data which is most small practices. Um, and anyone who uh, has a limited measure set, uh, and a lot of measures aren't easily extracted from an electronic data system. Most, of, A lot of them require someone to read the chart to understand the complex set of, uh, of requirements. So the, the lack of a measures group sampling process is going to be a problem. Now, I think on the good side, uh, Medicare's uh, um, their comments in the in the final rule uh, show that they're not they're misunderstanding the dynamics and open up. Uh, I will be responding to that again with a comment and hoping to get to, to change their mind uh, and bring that back in the 2018 year. Now I want to pause and say it is one o'clock, top of the hour. You've wasted a perfectly good hour with me, and it might be time to get back to work. So get something real done. Feel free to drop off now. As usual, we will stay on the line to continue answer, qu answering questions as long as answer, questions are flowing in. So um, uh, so stay on board if you if you want to. But uh, you won't hurt my feelings if you go get something real done uh, now that we're at one o'clock. Um, all right. I do have um, Karen asks. Can you only get the 50% CPIA scoring and the APM scoring if in a CMS APM? Is that then what is called the MIPS APM? All right, ooh, complex question. Um, well, the only APMs that are going to qualify for the, for the improvement activity scores are those that Medicare has approved. Um, and of course, in the first two years, there's only um, APM, the only APMs that are approved are those that are uh, Medicare only, so it's, they apply just to Medicare beneficiaries. Um, 
In later years, there's all payer models that have to affect uh, Medicare as well. Um, so, and the MIPS APM actually has a different connotation. Um, the MIPS APM is an APM that is not an advanced APM. Uh, the MIPS APM is, a, um, so by being a garden variety APM, uh, those participants are still susceptible to MIPS uh, and they, uh, they don't get the 5% uh, APM incentive. So, so that, that, that's the meaning of the, the MIPS APM. Um, so, and you get the 50% if it's an approved alternative payment model through CMS uh, and only those. So something, an ACO model, it's just a commercial insurance but hasn't been approved as an APM by Medicare would not get the 50%. Uh, and they would be, well, you wouldn't even consider them a, a MIPS APM, they'd just be pure MIPS because uh, Medicare would not, uh, one of the things that happens with a MIPS APM is Medicare accepts the entity's quality reporting and any, anything else they do for, um, oh, and the improvement activities, uh, other improvement activities that are there, they accept those for all the, the participants. And if it's not a Medicare approved APM, then it's, uh, then it's not going to be not going to have those advantages. Okay, um, I'm going to assume this is um, Heather, um, looks like a last name, but I think uh, uh, Heather asks, could you please explain how an organization could be part of an APM but also participate in MIPS? This piece is very confusing to me. Um, so interesting, um, yeah, that's confusing to everybody. Uh, um, So the uh, there there are two there there are two places where that comes into play. First, if you're not an advanced APM, you're still susceptible to MIPS. So if you if you're if you're uh, so uh, a great example, the Medicare Shared Savings Program, Track One, is an APM, but it's not an advanced APM. So your track one a, uh, shared savings plan comes forward into 2017. You are all that you are MIPS APMs uh, be, because you have to you have to report to MIPS as well as uh, um, be part of the APM. So the second piece, if you are part of a, an advanced APM, it's possible you're not going to be susceptible to MIPS, but there's a volume requirement. You only, you only get credit uh, with the incentive and freedom from MIPS if you hit these certain volume amounts. And if you don't hit those, you still have to report MIPS. Um, so those two pathways, um, either it's a, it's a garden variety APM, not advanced, in which case you're MIPS, uh, although the reporting done by the entity for you can fill some of your MIPS requirements, um, or you're an advanced APM but don't reach the volume thresholds to be either a QP or a partial QP. Uh, and in either case, you are, uh, you are in MIPS. Pardon? Okay. Well, looks like uh, no more questions coming in, so we'll uh, we'll make this an opportunity to uh, to flee and maybe en enjoy some of the sunshine that I see outside. Uh, we had snow yesterday here in Maine, um, and that's all got nothing in view right now. Um, so thank you very much. You've been very kind. You didn't throw anything. Uh, you asked some great questions, so I know you were paying attention. Uh, and join us again for our next webinar. Keep watch on our uh, um, at com slash webinars. Um, Ta-ta for now and enjoy your holiday. <laughs>